Coming up on this edition of Commuter Connections, we'll take you to the Baltimore Streetcar Museum for a look at the history of local transit. Also coming up, the MTA has launched the Bus Network Improvement Project. We'll tell you what that means and how you can help improve local bus service. Hard to believe, but the holidays are fast approaching. We'll show you how one organization is gearing up to feed the hungry this season. And the Ravens are back in action. We'll show you the best way to get to M&T Bank Stadium. All that and your questions in our Ask the MTA segment. All ahead on Commuter Connection. Hello everybody, I'm Terry Owens and welcome to Commuter Connections. For this edition, we're on location at the Baltimore Streetcar Museum where MTA and transit's history are chronicled and on display. From interesting exhibits to an actual ride back in time on a streetcar, a visit here is something the entire family will enjoy. And joining me with information on the museum is museum curator Jerry Kelly. Mr. Kelly, thank you so much for joining oh, us. My pleasure, my pleasure. You know, thank you so much. Like a lot of people, I've driven by this place probably a thousand times, and this is actually my first time inside. What is it about this place that it is such a well-kept secret? Well, first off is to relive history, and if you look around our visitor center here, the walls are adorned with photographs of various Baltimore neighborhoods, because Baltimore is a city of neighborhoods, and you're gonna see different neighborhoods depicted when streetcars were operating, and it's not unusual to see a family come in, a uh, husband and wife, a small child, and a grandparent, and suddenly somebody says, oh my gosh, that's the store where we used to shop, right on the corner there, see that? That's where we used to go to the grocery store, or that's where I went to school, or that's the amusement park. And we see this just about every day, people finding a little piece of history that relates to them, and they take that, uh, step back into time. And everything old is new again. We look at uh, the development of the current light rail system, the coming red line system. What does that do for industries like yours where we're trying to preserve history? Well, we're still thinking about when we're going to acquire our first light rail vehicle. <laughs> so we're, we're, we're always thinking ahead. But really what we're thinking about right now is November 2nd and 3rd which was the end of streetcar service as we knew it in Baltimore back in 1963. So the 50th anniversary of that is coming up on November 2nd and 3rd. We will be operating that weekend a number of streetcars, but one of the cars we'll be operating was the last streetcar to operate on the tracks of Baltimore, car 7407. Hopefully we'll have it out in a little bit. You can see it, maybe take a ride on it today. Plus, you're going to see a lot of enthusiastic people uh, here helping us celebrate what happened. We all know things, uh, things end, uh, but we don't let go of them. We still keep them going. All right. Well, thank you so much. Let's let our audience know uh, what your hours here are. If there's a website, they might find more information. We are on the web. Just put in Baltimore Streetcar Museum, and it will pop up. Uh, our hours are every Sunday, 52 weeks of the year, from noon until 5 and then on Saturdays from the first Saturday in June to the last Saturday in October, we're also open noon until five. And in addition to that, we have a very successful operation of, we call them charters or parties. If you wanna have a child's or an adult birthday party here, just give us a call. We've had several weddings here in the past year uh, just all kind of get-togethers. Um, we have a number of organizations visit us each year for their annual holiday party. So we can, we can be open anytime a group wants to come, but our Saturday and Sundays, noon until 5, are reserved when the public can come in and take a ride on the streetcar. Well, Mr. Kelly, thank you so very much for helping to preserve this history and volunteering your time. I know it is greatly appreciated by uh, the larger community and certainly the family at the MTA. I appreciate you. Oh, well, we, we appreciate what you do for us. You've been very, very good to the Baltimore Streetcar Museum. I can say that sincerely. Be good, good friends. We've got to take a break here, but coming up next, what's being done to improve local bus service today? 
and with an eye toward the future. Stay with us, we're back in just a moment. Welcome back everybody, I'm Terry Owens and this is Commuter Connections. For the first time in more than a decade, the MTA is doing a comprehensive review of local bus service. It's a major undertaking that's designed to ultimately improve the service on the street and to prepare the MTA for future growth in the region. But in order for this undertaking to work, the agency needs you to get involved. And here to tell us more about the Bus Network Improvement Project is Michael Walk. Acting Director of Service Development for the MTA. Michael, welcome. Thank you, good to be here. We are so excited about BNIP as we've been calling it throughout the agency because it's a tremendous opportunity to move the system forward. For people who don't know what that means, sum it up for us. Uh, the Bus Network Improvement Project is, it's an eight month project and what we're doing is we're collecting data of all different kinds. We're collecting data from the Baltimore Metropolitan Council which helps us know where people are trying to travel to and from. We're collecting ridership data. We're collecting data about route performance. And most importantly, we're also reaching out to the public for ideas about how to make the system work better. Okay, so the folks watching at home are gonna say, well, all that sounds well and good. How's that gonna help us get my bus to me on time? Yeah, that's the biggest and most important question I think that this project has to deal with. Um, you know, the goal number one of the whole project, the first things on the list is improve service quality. I mean, we at the MTA, we get feedback from customers all the time, not all of it positive. Uh, you know, I mean, buses are late and we have problems on the street. So we are really have to make better decisions about how the system is designed, whether it comes to how long the lines are or how much time we give in the schedule, that needs to be reviewed. And goal number one is to review that and make the system work better. So now this bus network improvement project is going to provide a number of opportunities for the public to engage. Give us a sense of what you're going to be doing. Yeah, so we have many different methods by which we're getting public feedback. The first is an online uh, website. It's uh, mtamaryland.mindmixer.com. And so you can go on there, create an account. We have questions posted. We're la looking for ideas to make changes to the system. and. Uh, Riders and users, they can interact with each other and uh, comment on each other's um, ideas. Uh, so we have the online engagement uh, there. And we also have a lot of face-to-face -face engagement planned. Um, starting October 15th, we're holding our first workshop. We've got six workshops. They're going to be held between October 15th and, uh, and the following week. And um, you can come and learn about some system redesign ideas, as well as provide your own feedback about what you would like to see happen with the system. Okay, and there's, I think there's also a phone number for folks who might not be able to get out to one of the activities or to engage online. That's correct. We do have a phone number. Uh, we call it the Bus Network Improvement Project Hotline. Uh, it's 410-454-1998. Uh, uh, and you can call that number, leave a voicemail. Um, we'll take that information down, whatever your idea is, if you have a suggestion for a change and we'll add that to the data that we're collecting. Wow, and this is the first time this has happened and quite a long time, so it's a tremendous opportunity to glean information from the public and to begin to move the system forward, which is everyone's goal. Oh, absolutely. I'm very, very excited to get this project off the ground, to get our riders involved, and to really move the bus network into the future. All right. Michael Walk is the Acting Director of Service Development for the MTA. We're delighted that uh, you were able to join us. Thanks so much. Glad to be here. Well, there are many strides being made at the MTA, and most of them are a direct result of the commitment of the O'Malley-Brown administration to double transit ridership in Maryland by 2020. To do that, the governor is making investments in new projects and equipment across the state. 
The governor recently rolled out his spending plans for the Baltimore region at the West Baltimore Mark Station, and Commuter Connections was there. Governor Martin O'Malley traveled to the West Baltimore Mark Station to make the big announcement. The O'Malley-Brown administration committing nearly $1.5 billion to transportation projects for the Baltimore metropolitan region. We have heard our president say uh, many times that in order for us to create jobs as a country, we must pull together the consensus to educate, to innovate, and to rebuild. And that's why these transportation investments are so very important. The governor was joined by elected officials and transit supporters from around the region, including Baltimore Mayor Stephanie Rawlings Blake, Congressman John Sarbanes, and Greater Baltimore Committee Chairman Don Fry. Everyone here keenly aware of the need to improve transportation in Maryland for current and future generations. And there's no doubt that throughout Maryland, uh, and it's true here in the Baltimore uh, region as well, that addressing our transportation needs is certainly one of our most pressing uh, and difficult challenges that we face uh, as a state. The funding package for the Baltimore region includes $689 million for the Baltimore Red Line. $246 million will be used to replace 100 rail cars on the Metro subway system in Baltimore. The package also includes funding for major road improvements in Howard, Baltimore, and Harford counties, all projects that mean thousands of jobs for the region. The other big news, the long-awaited announcement of weekend service on the Mark train system, set to begin December 7th. Congressman Elijah Cummings praised the governor and state lawmakers for making the tough decisions to fund transportation. And when I think about what we are doing today, it's about liberation is giving people the freedom to move. See, it's one thing to have opportunity, but if you can't get there, that's a problem. It's giving them an opportunity to have convenience. This whole thing with the Mark Line extension over the weekends is so very, very important. It frees people to live the best lives that they can. That's what this is all about. And there is much more ahead on MTA Commuter Connections. Coming up next, a look at area efforts to feed the hungry this holiday season. We're back in just a moment. This is a family that was almost fed by neighbors who almost volunteered to help them out. When it comes to giving, almost doesn't count. And we are back on MTA Commuter Connections. According to the USDA, more than 700,000 people in Maryland are uncertain of where their next meal will come from. They are, in fact, among the needy who go hungry each day in our state. The Maryland Food Bank is on a mission to fight hunger, especially during the holidays. Kate Sam is Communications Director for the agency, and she joins us with more on how we can help. Hi, Kate. Hi, how are you? Thanks so much for coming in. Absolutely. Does the Maryland Food Bank serve the entire state, or is it just the Baltimore region? We serve all of Maryland except Prince George's and Montgomery counties, and those are served by a sister food bank. Um, we're both members of Feeding America, which is the national food bank network. And so give me a sense of how your organization works. Sure. Um, so we are a really huge organization. We have three um, facilities, one in Hagerstown, one in Salisbury, one in Baltimore. And we serve a network of 975 soup kitchens, pantries, and shelters, schools, after-school feeding programs, senior centers across the state. Every one of those is, you know, on the front lines of hunger, getting food out each and every day to Marylanders in need. And of course, we hear more about you this time of year. We've got the holidays approaching, but this is a 24-7 operation, isn't it? It really is. Um, you know, it used to be that the holidays were our busy season. This past July, we did the same amount of distribution that we did last November. Okay. So the need is just huge year round, um, but you know, we take the holidays as an opportunity to get the word out, hoping that people will remember us year round. Um, and you know, the holidays, 
there's an emotional element to food. So it's, it's still important to help at this time of year. There's lots of families that are having Thanksgiving dinners that need that food on the table for their children and you know their own peace of mind. Well, now I can't imagine you can do this work without the support of a tremendous network of volunteers. Uh, how important is it for folk to, if you may not have anything to give in the way of cash or food, that you can donate some time? That is a great um, point, Terry. We need volunteers year round. Um, we have our warehouses operating uh, six days a week, two shifts a day, sometimes three. We rely entirely on volunteers to sort through all of our food drives and pack it up into categories like um, you know, canned meals, canned, uh, canned vegetables, things like that, that make it easy for us to get it out to the soup kitchens and pantries and shelters. So last year we hosted um, close to 10,000 volunteers. Right, and that saves our, you know, that saves us an operating cost, so we can keep those dollars flowing to food and to things that are really important. So now, if someone wanted some more information about the organization, is there a phone number or a website they could contact? Yeah, I would recommend um, calling us 410-737-8282. One more time. 410-737-8282. Okay. Um, and then you can also go online always, mdfoodbank.org. And if you can't get to the grocery store, if you don't have time, there are always a few extra bucks in the back of your wallet or somewhere tucked away. The Maryland Food Bank can certainly use those resources, especially as we get to this time of year when people are in extra special need. Kate, thanks so much for joining us and best of luck this holiday season. Absolutely, thank you. All right, well, the MTA played a major role recently in getting Marylanders to an important historic event. People from this area and across the country converging on our nation's capital to mark the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington. I have a dream. My four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. With the actual anniversary of the March on Washington falling on a weekday, many from the Baltimore region were able to ride Mark instead of driving. Well, it's easy transportation. Um, I'm back and forth in Washington, now I'm retired after two years, so I've been using the Mark just to go down to walk around the mall and, and, and explore, um, discover D.C. While many only know about the march and Dr. King's famous I Have a Dream speech from watching television, Robert White was among the thousands that journeyed to Washington in 1963. I was 14 years old. Uh, I really didn't want to go, but my grandfather took me. Uh, to this day, I'm glad that he did because um, it changed my life. As time went by, um, to be a part of history, to have marched in it, um, it was great. We created a framework, but there is still so much work left to be done. We come here to Washington to say we ain't going back. We are not afraid. Regina Brooks of Baltimore also wanted to be a part of the historic day and cited the convenience of Mark as her reason for leaving the car at home. She called the trip to Washington to stand where so many others did 50 years ago a duty. I think I'll see people who were there. I'll be standing there with people who were there at the original experience. I think that I will be there among people who um, honor his dream and who are anticipating do uh, doing what they can to bring his dream into fruition. When we turn not from each other, or on each other, but towards one another, and we find that we do not walk alone. That's where courage comes from. I hope it's going to be like, you know, almost the same experience as when it first happened, you know. I expect it would be just as great too, you know. Coming up next, are you ready for some football? If the answer is yes, we've got a game-winning plan to get you to all the Ravens' action. It's just ahead. Stay with us.
the elevator, and the blood bank. Both are ideas from the minds of African Americans. Support the United Negro College Fund, because a mind is a terrible thing to waste. Welcome back, everybody. I'm Terry Owens, and this is MTA Commuter Connections. Well, our world champion Baltimore Ravens are back at M&T Bank Stadium for what we hope will be another winning season. And we thought we'd take just a few minutes to remind you about the MTA service to the stadium. Buddy Alves is here with a game plan for getting you to all of the action this evening. Buddy, good to see you. It's great seeing you. Thank you so much for coming in. World champions, that's got a really nice ring to it, doesn't it? It does, and speaking of rings, have you tried on one of those big things? Oh my gosh, no, but wow. I have seen them and they are yeah. pretty amazing. They are amazing. Well, the season's underway, folks are doing their tailgate thing and the really smart people are hopping on light rail to get down to the stadium. Not only are they hopping on the light rail, they're hopping on the Metro subway and the local buses. Talk about uh, some of the options and what you find people take advantage of most, I guess. Well, uh, it's um, kind of a toss-up, really. Uh, we have a lot of local bus usage to get down to the games. In fact, there are 21 different buses that come right down near M&T Bank Stadium so that people can walk over. Light Rail, of course, stops right at the Hamburg Street stop, and all you gotta do is get out, walk up the bridge, and they're there. Metro Subway will stop at either the Lexington Market or at Charles Center, and they can uh, have an easy walk then over to the stadium. And then, of course, uh, a lot of people, when you come downtown, you have to deal with a parking issue. Talk about some of the advantages of riding, say, light rail or metro subway. Well, which would you rather pay? 20 to $25 to park somewhere downtown or $1.60 one way? Mm. That's the question. I think most people would like to huddle up on light rail, metro subway, the bus, with all their fans or fellow fans and make their way downtown for the cheap. Now, if I wanted to get one of those really cool calendars or brochures, what, oh, yeah. uh, where do we find those? These are all around town. Okay. We've got them everywhere. Um, we sent these out in particular to all the season ticket holders. It was stuffed into their packages. It gives you uh, the, the dates of all the games, the uh, preseason and all season long. Uh, we also put in here an announcement of something that we haven't had for several years. What's that? That is the Ravens Season Transit Pass. Oh my goodness. We haven't had that for about two, three years. It's back for only $35. You can just breeze on to light rail or metro subway or the bus, flash it and get on in there and not have to worry about standing in a line at the ticket vending machines to get a ticket. Well, how cool is that? That's very cool. So we've got it covered. Is that uh, purchased online or at the transit store? Well, our ticket or our pass sales have ended. They ended in September. And so that's over. So we're letting people know about this so that next year they'll be able to get this. Uh, it's gonna be a big favorite among our fans all over again. All right, that's Buddy Elves with the MTA Office of Communications and Marketing, always bringing us great news. Buddy, thank you so much. My pleasure. Well, coming up next, we'll answer your customer questions and concerns in our Ask the MTA segment. Stay with us. We're right back. Lifestyle can help your child succeed. Hi, I'm Tammy Bolden, the manager of the Systems and Equipment Engineering Department, and here is our first question for Ask the MTA. My name is Sherelle Hicks and I'm from Baltimore, Maryland. My question is, I would like to know if the MTA could increase the number 15 
express bus line between the hours of 4.30 and 5.30 p.m., Monday through Friday. The 15 Express operates only to and from Perry Hall, offering four express trips during the morning peak hours and four express trips during the evening peak hours. However, there is a quick bus 47 that actually offers additional stop services between Overly and the Walbrook Junction during the peak period hours. Now your question actually comes at a great opportunity because the MTA is assessing our entire bus network. So your request will be put into queue of our service request for analysis. Next question. I'm Barbara Andrews. I would very much like to know why can the MTA and fare inspectors start asking people that they see eating or drinking to stop eating or drinking so that light rails stay cleaner longer? Let's see, the MTA fare inspectors are to address each and every violation during the course of their duty. These infractions are called quality of life violations and are strictly enforced by the MTA police on all of our systems, which includes the light rail services. Individuals who are not compliant will be issued a citation by a police officer. So please keep in mind that the MTA fare inspectors are part of the MTA police workforce and they work hand in hand with the police officers to ensure the quality of life for our riding patrons. Next question. Okay, my name is Tiffany James and I live in Hamden in Baltimore, Maryland. And my question for the MTA is, would you release data to NextBus um, so that I could make good decisions about um, what form of transportation to take during the day? Thanks. That's a question that many, many of our customers are asking. And in reality, the MTA is in the process of developing a system to deliver real-time passenger information to all of our customers via your handheld devices, which are cell phones, your PDAs, and your tablets. The other thing, the other great thing is we're also actually offering the real-time information via the MTA website. Um, electronic message signs, as well as when you call 539-5000, there will be an, op an option to offer real-time information as well. We appreciate your questions. If you have a question you'd like to ask the MTA, visit the MTA website at mta.maryland.gov for a convenient TV show link or connect with us on Facebook or Twitter. Well, we've not only come to the end of another program, but to the end of my tenure as host for Commuter Connections. It's been an honor to work with some very talented people that produce this show, and I can tell you that more great programming on MTA Commuter Connections is in store. Join us next month for another great new season and new host next month. I won't say goodbye, I'll just say, until we see each other again, take care. I'm Terry Owens. Have a great day, everybody.